This is Dolores Cannon again with the Metaphysical Hour. And we're on the air again with another guest tonight. But before we start, I want to give the toll-free number in case anyone wants to call in. This number is 877-876-5227. 877-876-5227. And that number is toll-free all over the world because we know this show does go all over the world. And anyone can call in. But normally when I'm doing these shows, we don't get very many call-ins. I guess they're too busy listening. But that number is all worldwide. At first when I started doing these shows, I was wondering if anybody was listening because I sit here in my office and talk to the wall. (laughs) But now I know they are because I'm getting wonderful emails from everyone even as far away as Russia and New Zealand that say they are listening to this show. So maybe it is all worthwhile after all. (laughs) But before we do my guest, I want to remind everyone about the conference that's coming up. My publishing company, Ozark Mountain Publishing, is putting on its first conference called the Transformation Conference. It's going to be held in Fayetteville, Arkansas, on June the 3rd and the 4th, which would be next weekend. And we're doing it mostly to showcase a lot of our authors. And we have some very wonderful people that are going to be speakers. And I've been interviewing a lot of these during the last month. And the one we have tonight will be my guest is our keynote speaker, Arun Gandhi. And he is the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. And our publishing house published his book several years ago. It's called The Forgotten Woman, and it's the story, the the biography of his grandmother. And it is a very fascinating story. I think I know more about the Gandhi family than the average person because I had to edit that book. So I have a little bit of uh, more knowledge, I guess, than the average ones out there. But, uh, okay, Arun, you're there, aren't you? Yes, I am. And And thank you very much for having me on this show. Ten years ago, I think, that we first met. Yes, it's been many years. It was in uh, the ARE was having an Easter, I think it was the Sunrise Easter Conference out in Virginia Beach. Right, that's right. And you were the speaker, the main speaker, and I was there, and I think that's where we first met. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Quite a while ago. Yeah, many years ago. Yes, it's surprising whenever you think of it. Yeah. But I remember the time you were talking to me that you had been trying for a long time to find a publisher for your book, and people just wouldn't look at it. Yes, unfortunately, everybody kept saying that I should write about my grandfather, but nobody was interested in the story of my grandmother. Yes, but and there I is a kind of story there. It's a, it's like, it is a forgotten woman because it's a story that people really don't know. Yeah. She was she, really, uh, what did you call her, the mother of India? Yeah. The woman who unified the women of India. Yes. And, you know, there's always a woman behind every famous man. Mm-hmm. And I believe you said you spent 30 years researching that, didn't you? Yes, I did. I was, of course, working at that time as a journalist, and so I couldn't devote a lot of time to uh, researching. Uh, So whenever I had some free time or uh, free holidays or something, I would uh, work on that uh, research. Mm -hmm. My wife helped me a lot in uh, in doing the research, too. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Fernando. Yeah. And so we finally uh, got... Uh, enough material to be able to write a book of. I remember you saying that you were going and interviewing all the people you could find who were still alive that remembered your grandparents. Right. Uh, you know, because not much had been written about her by anybody except grandfather whenever he made a reference to her in his biography, autobiography. 
Uh-huh. Apart from that, there was not much written about her, so uh, we had to depend a lot on uh, memory of people who had lived with her and and worked with uh, with her. And uh, we kind of pieced together all of these uh, interviews from various people. And it was particularly difficult because all of them were so enamored by grandfather Uh that, uh, you know, they would start off talking about grandmother and very soon they would start talking about grandfather. And I had to keep uh, reminding them that I was more interested in grandmother than in grandfather. <laughs> well, he's, well, he's such an important figure that everybody else is more or less in his shadow. Right. And it's, it's difficult. <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> but I remember you did say that you found a box of very old letters in the ashram in South Africa, didn't you? Yes, I did. Uh, my parents had preserved all these letters for sentimental reasons. And after my mother died, my father had died much earlier, and my mother died in 1988. Uh-huh. And um, I uh, got those uh, letters from her uh, before she died, and uh, they, they, those were very valuable, too. Yeah, those uh, filled in a lot of the missing pieces, didn't they? Yes, they did. Mm-hmm. Because I was amazed when I was doing the editing on the book. That's where I found out a lot about Gandhi and your grandmother that I never do before, and I don't imagine a lot of people didn't know about this. Hmm. You know, when they made the movie, I think the movie is only a very small part of his life. Yes, indeed. Because that started much later. Uh huh. Yes, um, you know, his life was very full and... Uh... I think if they tried to make a movie of his entire life, it would go into um, probably two full movies or something. <laughs> I believe so. Yeah. Because one thing I think people didn't realize, that at the height of his career as a lawyer in South Africa, uh, they were very rich, weren't they? Yes, he was. He was very rich. He was earning uh, a phenomenal amount uh, as a lawyer. Uh, you know, I believe his practice had grown to something like uh, 65 to 70,000 pounds a year in uh-huh. those days in the 1800s. That was a lot of money. So and, he uh, was very successful and very rich. Yeah, because he was then the only Indian uh, lawyer in the whole country, in the whole of South Africa. Oh, the entire country. Yeah. So he had a lot of business. <laughs> so he had tremendous amount of business. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting in the book was that when he first became a lawyer, the very first case he tried, they, he said he couldn't even speak. Yes, he, uh, he he tried to set up a practice in India, uh-huh. and uh, he got a couple of clients, and uh, when he went to court to defend them, he couldn't get up and speak. He was so tongue-tied. <laughs> and uh, he had to refund their fees and walk out uh, in disgrace from there. And he reached a point when he felt that he wouldn't be able to do uh, any legal practice at all. And he was, in fact, looking uh, for a job as a teacher, high school teacher. Uh-huh. And uh, he was um, refused a job by the British administration because they didn't recognize the matriculation that he had done. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in spite of his having a law uh, uh, degree from England, uh, they were very uh, particular about the matriculation, so they refused uh-huh. him permission to teach. I think that ought to make people realize that people don't just start off full-blown, you know, as right. a success. Yeah, you know, uh, people uh, also need to realize that he was a very simple, ordinary man with all the same weaknesses that all of us have. Yeah, because how many people are afraid to get up and speak before people? Right. And it showed that he started out with the same fears that the rest of us have. Mm -hmm. He had to overcome a lot. He had to, yes, overcome a lot of things. You know, I have I found an article I was going to send to you that I found in a, a newspaper. It's been a few years ago. I should have sent it to you by now. But there were a lot of people that kept saying there was no proof 
that your grandfather ever attended the law school. It was, I think it was London, wasn't it? Yes, in London, yeah. And they kept saying there was no true. proof of that. Well, I that saw is. this article where as they were going through some real old records that they were going to throw out, they finally found papers uh -huh. that did prove that he did go to school there. Yes. So that ought to quiet a lot of the skeptics. Right. <laughs> the ones that are always trying to pull people down. <laughs> mm. People, you know, in, the, in these days, they're always looking for sensationalism. Yeah. And um, that kind of thing sells a lot. So, you know, sensationalizing things has become uh, a habit with people now. Yeah. But the reason I brought it up about your grandfather being very rich at one time was that that's why it was very difficult on your grandmother when yes. he suddenly decided he's going to change his entire life. Right. Uh -huh. And he practically decided this overnight. I was you know, he, were, yeah, he was coming from Johannesburg back to Durban where uh, the family was living. And uh, at the Johannesburg station, uh, a Jewish, uh, English Jewish friend of his, uh, Henry Pollack, uh, gave him a little booklet uh, called Unto This Last by uh, John Ruskin. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he started reading this in the train, and he says he just couldn't put it down. It was all about... Uh, uh, the effects of materialism and how it corrupts our life and, uh, you know, how we need to uh, simplify our living and, uh, you know, lives and all that. And, and he just read all through the night and by the next morning he was convinced that uh, what John Ruskin was saying was right. And so he, he decided that he was going to give up everything and, and simplify his life and live uh, on the farm. That's quite a decision from somebody who in that kind, you know, of a position of right. wealth like that. Right. So he just kind of, you know, in a flash, he gave up all his wealth and practice. and, and That uh, had a big effect on him. It had a tremendous effect on him. But I remember from your book, Castro uh, um, was not happy at all. Your grandmother. She no, was she wasn't. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, she was thinking more in practical terms. Uh, she had four boys. They had to be married, and they were, you know, she wanted to get things for their wives and, and yeah. so on, you know. Uh, and I think women are more uh, about, uh, they're more concerned about security. And, uh, and so she was... Uh, you know, fearful that you give up everything, what are we going to live on? And how how are we going to manage? She had servants. She had a big house. Mm -hmm. That's quite a decision. You have to really love someone if you're going to turn your entire life around. Yeah. But I know they were married since really since they were children. Yeah, they married at the age of 13. Yeah. And, uh, you know, oh. I mean, that was... Uh, uh, quite normal in those days. Uh -huh. Yes, it uh, was. Mm -hmm. But well, I believe, did you say that your grandmother for many years had a difficulty with switching to that way of life? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, she, uh, she always had uh, this difficulty uh, because, uh, you know, she came from a very different family. Uh, she was also a very uh, strong woman, uh, strong-minded woman.